Our second scripture lesson will bring us to the end of uh, chapter 2 of Paul's letter to the Galatians. You'll hear um, in Paul's words here, um, as he finishes off this autobiographical section um, that, we, that we started a couple of weeks ago, as he finishes this section off, you'll hear in his words um, references to Cephas or Peter um, that kind of look back upon or hearken back to that passage from the book of Acts and that experience that Peter had that, that transformed his, his understanding, expanded Peter's understanding of, of the gospel and who the gospel was intended to reach. Listen for, uh, for that vision that Peter was given to come to play in these words now of Paul. When Cephas, that is um, Peter, and so Cephas is um, the Aramaic name for Peter. Um, Peter is the Greek name, and so Paul is using the Aramaic name uh, for Peter here. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile, and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles, Know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Lord God, we ask that uh, once again that your spirit would open our minds, that we might uh, perceive and understand your word, um, this word that is for us life, this word that is for us um, a completely new way of seeing the world and understanding our lives. We pray, Lord, that that word would come alive for us here this morning, that we would be changed. Um, change us, Lord, by the power of your word. Uh, may it take root um, and, and sink deep roots down into our heart. In the name of Jesus, we pray. One true gospel, uh, as, we, uh, as we move through this letter to the Galatians, the focus is on, on Paul's proclamation of the one true gospel. Um, Paul has been emphatic in these first two chapters that there is no other gospel but the gospel that was revealed um, in and by Jesus Christ. Um, Apart from Jesus Christ, there is no revelation, there is no understanding, no knowledge, and no salvation. And our, uh, our journey so far has taken us um, from his introduction, uh, as he is introducing us to um, his concerns and these churches to which he's writing there in, um, in southern Galatia, uh, churches that he 
helped to establish in his first missionary journey. Um, again, he, he says right off the bat, and, and remember Galatians doesn't start with flowery uh, Thanksgiving and warm fuzzies. Um, Paul jumps right into it because of how serious the issue is. Um, there is but one way, there is one name um, under heaven by which we may be saved. And then he starts into um, this uh, autobiography. So we, we encounter Paul's, the, this curious story of Paul who is um, born into a family um, of Jews who are probably so proud of him because here is our little Paul is growing up to be a rabbi of rabbis. Oh, look at how he loves the law. Look at how he studies the scriptures. Look at how well he is able to articulate um, and answer the questions of the faith. We are so proud of our little Saul at the time before his name is changed. Our little Saul is growing up into, and he's going to be one of the leading rabbis. His name, he will be one of the rabbis who people will quote. When they're, when they're debating the law and the understanding of the law, Saul is going to be one of the ones who they, who they quote and they name, oh, well, Rabbi Saul says this. And then this abrupt change because he meets Jesus, the risen Jesus, on the road to Damascus. And we start down this, um, this uh, uh, little trail of Paul's autobiography that's not, again, it's not about um, uh, Paul kind of wanting to, to share a little personal testimony, um, but he is trying to say throughout this autobiographical section that my gospel, the gospel I proclaim, is, um, is the gospel and it came from Jesus. It owes um, its origin to no person, no other man, no other authority, but the risen Jesus. Jesus is, is the one who lays behind my gospel. And Paul is, has a unique place in this early leadership um, of, of the Christian church. His unique place is in taking the gospel to the Gentiles. One size fits all. That the gospel is for Jews and Gentiles alike equal fit. Um, with, without having to do any kind of adjusting. And now we hit uh, the heart of the matter as we come to the end of this uh, section in chapter 2. Um, what uh, Paul is beginning to make a transition now. Um, and, and he's leading us into the real heart of the letter, the real, um, you know, if you think about what we've been, um, what we've been countered to this point has been the, the bread um, or the bun. Now we're getting to the meat, um, the heart of, of, uh, of what Paul has to say, the, the thick, substantial, um, theological, um, biblical argument that he's going to make. Um, to defend and to explain this gospel that he's received by revelation from Jesus. And so as we come to the heart of the matter, we, we have one more um, encounter here then that Paul recounts with Peter. Remember, he's already talked about his meeting with Peter and James, the brother of Jesus, um, and John, who is John um, of the, the gospel and the letters of John and the book of Revelation. Peter had, or Paul has already told us about his, his meeting with them privately in Jerusalem, and he receives the right hand of fellowship. They say to him, um, look, blessing be upon you because you have been appointed to go to the Gentiles, we go to the Jews, um, but, but that's, uh, that's all part of God's purposes for the gospel to go out into all of the, all of the world. And, uh, and, and probably what's happened is... Um, Paul and Barnabas have, um, have been on this missionary journey, that map that we saw earlier. And they've gone back to Antioch, which is their home base. Um, Antioch is the Roman capital of the, the province of Syria. Okay? It is um, the third largest city in the Roman Empire. 
Um, it's a, it is a cosmopolitan city. There are Jews, a significant Jewish population. There are Gentiles. There's commerce. There is the presence of the Roman army, um, presence of the emperor. Um, it's a bustling place. They've returned to Antioch, which is their home base. And they have returned to find this, that Peter, for some reason, has come to visit Antioch. And when he first arrives, um, it's clear from Paul's words that he, um, as he has grown accustomed to do since the Cornelius event in Acts that we read about, he is um, sitting down at table fellowship with Gentiles, okay, um, with Greeks, um, with non-Jews. Um, and that means sitting down to eat things that you've never eaten before, okay? Um, enjoying some good pulled pork with the Greeks because Jews never ate pulled pork. Um, Jews didn't eat certain kinds of birds. Jews didn't eat certain kinds of fish uh, because they were all proscribed. They were, um, they were not allowed um, but because of the Mosaic um, law because of the Levitical um, um, law, um, the Mosaic Covenant. Something has happened. Paul returns to find that Peter, who has, um, has grown accustomed to eating with the Gentile Christians who have become friends, who have become brothers and sisters of his, and now he has withdrawn his table fellowship. Note how strong Paul's words are. I confronted Peter face to face, and he says that he did it before them all. Now, you have to stop and imagine just how significant um, this would have been. Imagine um, Peter is, is one of, if not the most important figure, the most important leader in that early Christian community. And here is Paul um, confronting him in public now because of how serious Peter's actions are. How, um, how detrimental Peter's actions are to um, the proclamation of the gospel. It's Paul's way of saying um, to us, to the Galatians, look, um, again, this is so serious that I was willing even to confront Peter in front, publicly, in front of all of the others, um, to challenge him. And what does he say to Peter? He says to Peter, look, uh, you ate with Cornelius. You had that vision. We've heard that story. A and even when you came here to Antioch, when you first got here um, to visit, for whatever reason you came, um, you're eating with um, your Greek brothers and sisters. And you're eating their Gentile food without any kind of qualms. And now all of a sudden, and, and what it says is that these, um, uh, these um, people from James have come. And people from the circumcision party are there. Um, and all of a sudden, Peter starts to backtrack. And Paul's not going to give him any wiggle room. Peter wants to backtrack, and he wants to withdraw from table fellowship with the Gentiles. And Paul won't have anything of it. He confronts Peter. Um, he confronts Peter because he knows that the very truthfulness of the gospel is dependent upon the behavior of people like Peter demonstrating in their behavior that indeed the grace of God is one size fits all. That, that the Jew and the Gentile are justified in Christ not by the works of the law. And so we come to the heart of the matter, um, number two. Um, so we have, to, we have to do some definitions here. Okay? As we head into this part, and, and verse 15 in, in the letter to the Galatians, verse 15 marks Paul's transition. Now he's introducing, again, the real substance of what he's writing to the Galatians about and really what he's writing to us 21st century Christians about because the issues are in many ways no different. And so a few definitions that we have to have um, clear in our mind as we move on in the letter to the Galatians. First, this definition of what it means to be justified. 
Paul is going to use this language um, consistently throughout Galatians, and we find it in Romans, we find it in all of his other writings. When he talks about being justified, he's talking about um, one's standing before the Lord God Almighty. One stands um, before the Lord God Almighty either justified or condemned. Either justified or condemned. The way that uh, one, one uh, dictionary puts it is this. Justification is fundamentally a divine declaration that a believer is in the right with God and righteous before God. It refers to a person's status before God apart from their moral status. Apart from their moral status. Justification, to be justified, it, it's language that is borrowed from the courtroom scene. Um, in a courtroom, a judge will declare someone justified or condemned. Innocent or guilty. Um, and they do so based upon um, the evidence, based upon the facts, as it were based upon uh, the history, based upon the testimony. And, and when Paul is talking about being justified, he's talking about um, how is it, how is it that we can stand before a holy and righteous God and be justified, be declared right with God, to be declared righteous, or um, so righteous is to be in conformity with God's will. Um, to be con in conformity with God's purposes for life as human beings. How is it that we can be justified before a holy and righteous God? Does that come about through works of the law or by trusting in Jesus? That's the issue at hand works of the law, and again, he repeats this phrase, works of the law, several times in this passage. And works of the law um, is, um, when Paul uses the word law here, he's not talking about law in general. He's not talking about the Roman law. He's not talking about civil law. He's talking about the Mosaic covenant. He's talking about um, the law um, that we read in the Old Testament. Now, the Old Testament law, the Mosaic Covenant, covered every part of Jewish life. There wasn't one aspect of Jewish life that was not touched by the Mosaic law. And, and that's why the Jews were so, uh, the Jews of Paul's time were so careful to keep the law because they knew that, that they had been sent into exile for failing to keep the law. And if they wanted to get out from underneath Roman rule, if they wanted God to to restore them, they had to keep the law faithfully. That's why Paul was studying to become a rabbi. That's why he had a zeal. He had a zeal for um, the ways of his people, as he says. Um, all to have that um, changed when he meets Jesus. Works of the law refer to the commandments given by God in Mosaic legislation. So, so you go back to Exodus, uh, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, you have um, the law spelled out there. That's the Mosaic legislation. In both its ceremonial and moral aspects, precepts that are commanded by God and thus holy and good in themselves. That The works of the law is to attend, um, to focus in on, zero in on, with the determination to keep. God's law. And the question that inevitably is, um, arises when one looks at the law and says, I'm going to be justified before God by the keeping of this law, the question that always arises is, have I done enough? Have I done enough? Am I good enough? So I started uh, driving for Uber um, a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Thanks to Mary Lou, she hooked me up. So, uh, but it's fun. There was 
for, for me, I'm a social person. I, I enjoy it, and I meet all kinds of different people. And uh, every now and then, uh, you know, I've been able to have conversation with folks, you know, talking about what do you do, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, and there's always that moment when I, you know, when I, if somebody asks and we get to the point, I say, oh, I'm a pastor, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, the tone of the conversation, is, it's always interesting, you know, somebody who's been swearing and they stop swearing. You know, um, you know but here's, here's the most common, here's the most common response for someone who, um, and, and I think what it reveals is it's somebody who has this, kind of general sense of American religiosity. I believe in God. Yeah, there's a higher power. I believe in a God. Um, but with no real understanding or knowledge of who Jesus is. You know, because inevitably it's something like this. Um, well, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, because it's this young gentleman who I picked up, uh, did, did a, or gave a ride um, this past week. This is, this is pretty much what he said. Quite verbatim, but all pretty close. You know, well, I, you know, I just, I just really think, you know, I, I still believe I don't go to church or, you know, any of that stuff anymore. But um, uh, oh, he, he had been raised Jehovah Witness. Oh, there was, you know, there was too much do's and don'ts for that for me for that. But, but you know, I know there's a higher power. I, I really, I really feel the presence. You know, and, and I just, I just think, you know, you, you just try to be a good person there. When do you know if you've been a good enough person to everybody? How do you know? How do you know if you have been good enough to stand before a holy and righteous God and say, oh yeah, I'm justified because I have measured up to what you expect? How do we know when that's happened? You know, now, I mean, Paul's point here in confronting Peter and saying that a person is not justified by works of the law. And, and Paul's specific concern is this. Um, so we're going we're to get into the, um, we'll, get, we'll come back to this, am I good enough? But Paul's specific concern is this, that Peter, you're trying to say to your Gentile, your, your Gentile Greek-speaking brothers and sisters, that all of a sudden, if they really want to be justified before God, they have to start doing the Mosaic Law. They have to start eating um, like um, Jews have, have always eaten. They have to get circumcised. They have to, uh, they have to start doing um, all of the other things that are prescribed in the Mosaic Covenant. Is that what you're saying, Peter? That it's not enough to trust in Christ's sacrifice? If we are justified, says Paul to Peter, if we're justified by works of the law, then Christ died in vain. Christ died for nothing. In fact, Paul says to Peter, look, this is a good thing. We realize now that we are sinners just the same as our gent we always We always thought, um, well, we are part of the covenant, and so even though there is, we understand the Jews' sin, we're part of the covenant and we're justified, but those Gentile sinners are lost. Now, the Paul is saying to Peter, look, the good news is this. We realize we're, we're sinners just like the Gentiles, and we're justified in just the same way. That it, that it doesn't come down to whether I, have, um, whether I have broken one of the commandments today, or whether I have failed to keep the covenant, whether I have failed um, in some form or fashion. That it's not about um, being ultra-Jewish anymore. It's about recognizing, acknowledging, um, seeing Jesus for who he is as our Messiah. It's not by works of the law, but it is by um, faith in Jesus Christ. This is at the heart of the gospel, um, believing, trusting in Jesus Christ. I put in, in quotation marks there because um, it's it is uh, variously translated faith in Jesus or the faithfulness of Jesus, Jesus' own faith in God. And in many ways, it kept both of those are involved. We trust in because Jesus was faithful. We trust in Jesus because he himself was faithful to the covenant 
where no other person has been faithful. He has been obedient in a way that no other person has been capable of being obedient to the covenant. So let's, uh, let's put July 4th in focus here. Uh, and so, uh, sidebar, um, this is explanation. It's not going to be, it's, this isn't an apology. I'm just going to explain. Um, we don't do, I, I choose not to do patriotic music because it mixes um, purposes. Um, we're here to worship our God. Um, we're here to worship our God and Jesus Christ. And I want, to, um, I want to say very clearly how important um, this national holiday tomorrow is. So, so don't let the lack of um, any kind of patriotic hymns um, diminish um, in your estimation my view of July 4th and the importance of July 4th as Americans. And the importance uh, of July 4th for what our, as a nation, our responsibility to the world with regard to um, the value we have for democracy, for freedom, um, for the pursuit of justice, for the voice of um, every person, regardless of race, ethnicity, um, gender, religion. But let's put it into um, proper focus. And maybe all the more so uh, put it into proper focus, given the fact that we can turn on the news um, any day, um, any morning we can get up, and it seems like it is a fresh report of violence, a fresh um, report of terroristic attacks, a fresh report of um, some kind of natural calamity. And there is a danger, there is a danger that lays before us that says um, the answer is with our country. That the answer is that our savior is our government, our army, our whatever. And my friends, let's, let's, this is why I want us to, in worship, to focus on Jesus because the country the government, the army, weapons, um, legislation will not save us. Paul comes to the end of this autobiographical section, and what does he say? He says, look, it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. That that my hope and my confidence in this life, in this present life, um, is not in my ability to preserve my life, but in the very reality that I have died with Christ. That is my only and sure hope. And that's the same for us, my friends. There is no justification. We don't stand before a righteous, holy um, um, creator God um, justified um, by our power or by any other power that is um, that is earthly, man-made, human-made, woman-made, whatever. Um, but we are saved. We are empowered um, by the God who comes to us in Jesus Christ. We are empowered by His Spirit. Um, we have in our baptism been buried with Christ and we come up out of those baptismal waters alive. And Paul's autobiographical words ought to be our words. That in this day when we think, um, when, it, when the, again, the, the temptation is to, uh, like Henny Penny, run around um, uh, screaming, um, crying out that the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Well, the sky has been falling since um, Adam and Eve ate the fruit um, that God said don't eat. Since that time, the sky has been falling, um, and there has been um, various forms of violence and terrorism and oppression and reasons to be fearful. 
and in the midst of all of, in the midst of all that we face, and in, in the midst of all that we celebrate this weekend as a nation, and celebrate we should, and thank God we should, but in the midst of it all, we still have to come back to this affirmation of Paul that in the end we're justified. We are saved. We are redeemed. We are a new creation because of what Jesus has done and what Jesus will do. The, the story hasn't ended. That, that our lives are hidden with Jesus. They're hidden with Christ even now. That, my friends, is what sustains us. That is what gives us power to get up each day and um, to walk and live with hope. And that's the message that we have to, to share with Paul, with, Paul um, with all of those who we encounter. This message of hope that we have in Jesus Christ. There is no justification by works of the law, but only in trusting, trusting in the God who has come to us, given us of his very life in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Holy and righteous God, we give you thanks and praise that you indeed have redeemed us, you have saved us, you have reconciled us. Um, we thank you and praise you, Lord, that you um, have restored us to life. We thank you that our lives are hidden um, with Christ in heavenly places. And that right now, uh, in these bodies, in this world, it is not we who live, but Christ who lives in us. Help us, Lord, to know this reality, to know it and to live it and to trust and to trust in Christ alone. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.